next to artist Osvaldo Ramirez Castillo. We are currently at the Vancouver Art Gallery in Vancouver, BC. And we, this is just a very exciting moment to see Osvaldo's work exhibited in the exhibition called The Stories That Animate Us. And so we're just so fortunate amidst COVID to be able to gather at the Vancouver Gallery without any public, so that feels amazing. And Osvaldo, so I mean, it's just so great to have you in person. We've been talking over the screen for so long, over the phone. That's right. I've only seen your work uh, digitally before, so it's just such a, such a treat to actually see it in person and really engage with it. And just because we have you here, could you tell us a little bit of, about this work? Originally from El Salvador, and uh, my work uh, is informed by the memories uh, of my childhood. Uh, Primarily, uh, the Civil War uh, during the 80s. So, I'm in constant conversa conversation with my uh, with the legacy and impact of the Salvadorian Civil War in the 1980s. And uh, and beyond that, my work also is starting to deal with deal with themes around healing, growth, and regeneration using plant growth coming out of characters in my work. Uh, so you see limbless, limbless soldiers with uh, vegetation or plant life or flowers coming out of their torsos. Um, you see a lot of that. Uh, dismembered bodies, right, that are in the process of regrowth, regeneration, uh, or healing uh, through, through plant growth or overgrowth. So, and I also mix in some hybrid imagery that pertains to pre-Hispanic uh, uh, mythology or aspects of Salvadorian popular culture uh, or folklore. So, yeah. Thank you. So, just hearing you uh, speak, um, it really makes a lot of sense. And I also notice uh, quite um, a lot of uh, iconography here. And I'm just wondering if maybe you can uh, just tell us a little bit more because right here in the middle figure that we see is this, this is some sort of mask, yeah. uh, perhaps like a horse. Um, where, where is this imagery coming from? Uh, largely from Central American popular folklore uh, that's, that's exhibited in the different dances, um, street performances performed in small towns during uh, patron saint uh, festivals or holy week ce ce fest ceremonies or festivals. And a lot of this is partly the syncretic, that syncretic mix of Catholic iconography with pre-Hispanic um, um, popular folklore uh, that has developed over centuries, right? So I'm mixing those two worlds in my work. Um, so there's a lot of animal masks, uh, a lot of some regalia that pertains to like street dances that are performed out on the street. Uh, and I'm just mix, mixing those aesthetic aspects, those aesthetic elements in my work uh, to talk about those themes that I have been part of my childhood, right? So a mix of uh, Catholic um, iconography and uh, the syncretic mixing or hybridity that has happened over centuries is, is something I like to explore in my work a lot and use it as a way, as a platform for healing, for hope. Because it's not all just about the civil war. Mm -hmm. It's about healing and reconciliation with that past. What is it that brings us together as Latin Americans, right? We are, we're, mm. we're such a diverse group um, <clears throat> of different um, entities, identities geographically, it's, we're so different. But yet, when I do see your work, there is mm -hmm. some sort of, I think it definitely is this kind of uh, feeling comfortable with the mixtures of cultures, with the syncretism that you speak about. It's something that we are also very familiarized with in Mexico, right? So although I wasn't able to read exactly, you know, this kind of mask or <clears throat> the kind of attire, it, it also called to me um, on, on some Mexican um, uh, side countries, right? Some sort of pueblos. Yeah. Uh, where I would see these sort of similar behaviors, but not entirely the same. So that's, that's something quite interesting. I'm also wondering about the landscape. So we do have some sort of landscape that seems imaginary, um, but also quite precise. So what, what is about this, um, this architectural structure that we see here and that landscape? What is, can you tell us a little bit about that composite? Yeah, sure. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because uh, this piece, uh, the 
structure that you see here is, is, is inspired by an actual life structure that got swept away by the surf, by the ocean, uh, by the tides of, uh, of a beach called El Espino in El Salvador. And I used to frequent that beach every time I went back home to, to have a good time, to have a vacation, to just be by myself, reflect. And I would see these structures by the, by the, uh, the surf and that had just broken off from the main buildings and uh, and this structure no longer exists but i recorded it i took pictures of it i filmed it and uh I'm, i made a piece based on that memory uh, based on the memory of that structure and uh, the piece is actually called uh, it's titled uh, shipwreck shipwreck in in, in, a, in el espino and so you have three figures migrating towards it as if offering, uh, as if to make some sort of offering to this falling structure or a structure that is about to collapse uh, by time, by memory. And uh, so this largely talks about memory, uh, the fleeting, um, fragmented mem memory, uh, but also as a way to use it as a platform to, to heal. To make a piece with it, as you see here, this sort of procession or pilgrimage is walking towards it, uh, as if to make offerings to this structure that is about to disappear. That's very, uh, it's very beautiful and powerful, and in a sense also very oneric and, and universal as well. And I've just noticed that the shore. So yeah. Thank you for pointing that out. It's yeah. very. Uh, it's very, it's not very present, but now that you notice it right here, that kind of yeah, blue, blue water. Yeah, the sea line, right? It's yeah. Beautiful. I've also included some like uh, uh, cacti, like right. cactuses and yucca plants. Mm -hmm. I'm also just fascinated by desert landscape. I like big, wide open spaces. So like I love the ocean and the desert landscape. So I'm including a lot of plant life pertaining to thorny uh, vegetation, like, uh, like the kinds of kinds of cacti that you see in the desert or yucca plants that are also part of the, you know, our, our, our countries, our geography, right? Um, the plants uh, that persevere in, in, that in harshness. Yeah. yeah, that's so beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> so speaking of landscape, um, it also recalls that second piece you have on the wall. Um, we also, it also seems um, there's some sort of deconstruction happening uh, on, on this surface, it could be, I don't know, a planet, or it could actually be a place on Earth. Um, there's also uh, several uh, planetary bodies in the back. There's more than one sun. Mm -hmm. So again, this piece, um, it's very uh, oneric. Uh, it seems like there, it's oh. charged with symbolisms to me. Yeah. Uh, but what about you? I mean, you're the artist. What, where, where was this um, image or this story coming from? Yeah, no, I like your reading. Uh, like every time someone talks about my work and they they share their reading about it, just uh, I make more connections in my mind. So thank you for bringing that up, how you saw it as a piece that's been de deconstructed and how there are some several uh, planetary bodies, as you, mentioned, as you say. Um, that just gave me ideas about um, some of the things I was trying to achieve, which was to um, work with a destroyed landscape like or a landscape uh, or, or a rubble landscape and just try to uh, try to make it abstract um, with um, just by working with different processes in the studio it's something that you don't think much about when you make decisions at the studio it just sort of happens but I wanted to mix in uh, like a destroyed landscape uh, with vegetation or plant life protruding through the cracks. Um, the idea of like flowers in the rubble calls to mind. And also um, just playing with the idea of beauty as hope as well. And I'm also, just lately I'm getting into <laughs> ideas of sacred geometry in my work. Um, using uh, geometrical shapes more uh, well using the the, the the circle but also having these uh, super straight uh, rays these lines protruding out of them as if as if signifying halos right 
Um, so you're referring to you're referring to, for example, these uh, circular forms. It's something that just kind of happens subconsciously. It's it's uh, it's hard to even <laughs> to talk about it. It's, it's just to me visually, as I'm making the decisions in the studio, is what makes sense to me. And uh, the ideas kind of come later, like the, the, the you know the theorizing of ideas, the working through ideas of the studio, they kind of come later. But the decisions that you make as you make as you're working through this just sort of happens mm -hmm. by um, by you know by the themes that you've been revisiting over time, mm -hmm. right? And so my idea was to to work with a destroyed landscape in a way that that. Um, that speaks about beauty and hope uh, by the different elements that you see throughout the land, throughout the rubble. Um, I'm also influenced by patron saint culture. Mm -hmm. It's such a treat to have you here and be able to, to get an insight from, of your work. You told me that there, these sort of um, orange spots were actually, um, it was actually collage, Yeah. right? Yeah. Right, thank you for bringing that up. It's little bits that I forget about my process to mention. Um, and one of the things is that I, I, this is all collage. It's very seamless, but I like to rearrange, <laughs> cut out pieces throughout the paper surface and uh, figure out what looks right. Um, in this case, I, I have this blood spots kind of like emerging from the destroyed rubble. Uh, I never, I didn't plan this, it just sort of happened, but the idea to make a landscape more abstract than what it actually looks like in real life is something that I'm working through right now. I like the idea of cutting, uh, cutting, splicing, you know, uh, and then repositioning those cutout pieces throughout uh, the paper surface. So that's something that I'm exploring right now. Thank more, you. More of that, yeah. And uh, just because we have it here, and I have so many questions, but um, there's there's this one element on this composition that really calls your eye, okay. and that's that this figure uh, or this sort of I, I don't know this kind of construction of, of different uh, figures. Uh, yeah. it, it definitely recalls some uh, pre-Hispanic iconography. There's some sort of duel going on there. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what's happening in there? Yeah, I mean, from what I've from what I've learned in, in pre-Hispanic mythology, it's a lot of deities and gods are in this constant battle of life and death. But that life and death conflict is always um, is always about it's, it's always done with a purpose, and the purpose is to regenerate life. So when there's an end, there's a beginning, and that's a lot. That's a theme that's replayed in, in, in pre-Hispanic mythology. So um, I like to. Um, play with, um, you know, use aesthetic elements of that struggle in my work through uh, hybrid imagery, hybrid beasts or monsters with uh, masks. Um, yeah, in my, in my work before it used to be a lot more constricted. Um, I used to really compress the paper surface mm -hmm. with, I used to basically fill it in a lot and I had this obsessive uh, almost a quality to my work where you you saw more of that um, than what I'm doing now. Now there's a more expansive nature around um, this, my subject matter. Like there's more breathing space uh, for people to read my work, um, so it's not all cramped in, right? But I still go back to those to to that <laughs> to that obsessiveness every now and then, and that's presented here a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> There's uh, so much to unravel from each uh, individual piece, so I really hope that um, this little uh, visit uh, incites people to come and see these works in person, because it's um, definitely a, a treat. So the gallery is open, and I hope that people do come. Um, but just right, I also have more questions because yeah. you were speaking about these sort of uh, patron saints and and including this sort of halo uh, around their their, their heads. And I noticed that you have some sort of portraits uh, in, on that wall. So Osvaldo, we're standing here in front of uh, three portrait pieces. Mm -hmm. um, we see definitely there's still a lot of uh, iconography. And there's one uh, subject, a female subject that is holding a, rather has a halo uh, around her head. And, um, one 
One thing that definitely um, really uh, jumps here is that kind of contrast between, you know, icons of beauty such as flowers, mm -hmm. right, and and delicate delicacy or delicate uh, mm -hmm. objects, and then we see a contrast with um, a little bit of aggression, perhaps. So we see weapons, right, and we see barbed wire. So can you tell us a little bit more about these choices and um, more about this work? Sure, these are uh, three figures that you see here hoisted up by sticks. So it's only their torsos that are being held by uh, sticks. And each one, I would say they're symbolic of the political reality of back home. So this, a lot of these, uh, two of these I would say, uh, maybe all three have a lot to do with post-war issues like the violence that you see now um, and a lot of what's happening uh, in present-day El Salvador is, is uh, gang violence and it's which is represented in one of the figures here on the on the right hand side and I'm just exploring you know post-war um, uh, issues through the different characters that make up our our society, right? And by and large, it's, it's, these are figures that affect a lot of uh, a lot of Central American countries, even even Mexico, right? But uh, a lot has to do with the connection of uh, basically the legacy and the memory uh, of violence and the impact of that today through these characters. And I would say that some of these are. Um, the, the ones, uh, the two on the very f on, on the, on the left-hand side are soldiers uh, with flowers coming out of them. The one on the left is uh, has a halo in it, um, and obviously I'm referencing patron uh, saint culture in, in Central America. And these are just uh, aesthetic themes, themes that are part of my child childhood. You know, um, like Catholic. Uh, <laughs> symbology, uh, ritual is is fascinating to me, and so I connect just the aesthetic elements of of Catholicism into my work. Again, to ex to re-examine my relationship to violence, my relationship to the memory of of, uh, of, of the civil war, of the armed conflict. Um, that's something that I keep revisiting. Right now we're standing in front of uh, two other of your works. Um, they, you know, they we're probably speaking more about some sort of still life, I guess, if we have to put it in a category, but I think that's the thing about your work as well. It's sort of, um, it, it's kind of, your work kind of escapes uh, categories in a sense, um, but just to, just to, to put it on something. And, and we see, we see a car that also seems uh, sort of abandoned, uh, perhaps, it's been through an accident. Also, we're not looking at a luxury car, and there's um, smoke coming out. No, una carcacha, tal vez como how we say in Spanish, carcacha. Um, and then we also see these sort of tropical plants, uh, kind of growing out of mm. out of this. Again, it's a continuation of uh, of ideas around uh, growth, uh, regrowth, or overgrowth. Uh, plant life or vegetation taking over that which has been destroyed or entities or things or objects that have been that have collapsed over time and you have nature and the idea of beauty uh, as nature I suppose taking over uh, playing with I'm just playing with ideas of healing uh, and what that looks like uh, as a visual as a visual language for, uh, for, for me and I also like to incorporate effigies, uh, things that look like scarecrows, that, uh, that are just... It's, it's the kind of imagery I grew up uh, in El Salvador, uh, visiting the, the, the countryside. And I would see just a lot of, you know, um, scarecrows on, uh, on, on, on the fields, on the cornfields. And, uh, and it's, it's something... This is the kind of imagery that has impacted me. Uh, since childhood that keeps coming back in my work and uh, yeah 
we always talk a lot about artists, um, you know, with the intention, like where, where are my visual references coming from? But I think there's a lot also coming after the fact, right? So after you've created your work, and then when you look at this work, do you, do you unveil something else? So for, I guess what I'm trying to say is, in this sort of um, com this, uh, X composition, there seems to be some sort of pants or shirt, um, some sort of clothing. And I, yeah. I guess I'm just wondering, like, after, after you're done with this work, like, also, how do you, how do you read it? What it um, becomes for you? Oh, how do I, do you mean that, that piece specifically? We yeah. can talk about any, any specific, but um, yeah. we can use this as, a, as an example. Yeah, no, thanks for that question. I, I'm thinking of the plight of migrants and uh, the, articles of, the articles of clothing that are left in the, in the desert landscape. And so I've been just motivated by ideas of migration through like the, the, the discarded clothes and, and make drawings out of that. Um, and, and in this particular piece, um, you, you see this like article of clothes uh, being held up by sticks as if it's been crucified, crucified in a way. Um, it's on an X, so, um, but, and again, by, again, uh, the redeeming the redeeming factor is plant growth coming out of these effigies, these, these uh, you know torsos or manipulated uh, limbs uh, replaced by sticks and uh, plant life or vegetation. So those are things that I try to balance out um, beauty and disaster through elements that I find uh, healing for my for. for my practice and my life as an artist, right? Osvaldo, thank you so much for taking the time uh, to, you know, guide us and give us this uh, exhibition visit of your work. We are, again, super thrilled to be here and to see your work. And as I had said before, there's just so much to unravel from Osvaldo's work, so I really hope that this little snippet and this little um, sneak peek incites people to come and unravel the works by themselves. Osvaldo, thank you so much. Thank you, Mirad, for inviting me for this. It's been fun, and I uh, hope you all come and see the show. I am standing next to Zoe Chen. She is the assistant creator at the Vancouver Art Gallery and the curator of the exhibition, The Stories That Animate Us. We are thrilled to be uh, in her company, so she can give us a little bit uh, of insight into the exhibition. So Zoe, could you please tell us a little bit about the exhibition, The Stories That Animate Us? Sure, so this is an exhibition that I co-curated with my colleague, the interim, interim chief curator, uh, Diana Frundle. So in our project, we wanted to use works for our collection, but also animations and drawings by local artists. Another theme that developed that was very strong was the ideas of um, stories and um, different presenting just a range of stories, a range of uh, storytelling techniques, um, perspectives, aesthetics uh, from different, from just like a range of different artists. So now we're obviously very interested in knowing a little bit of the backstory of how you uh, heard about Osvaldo's work, um, you know, how he came to mind and, and he was a, a must for this exhibition. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, we were also kind of just talking about before about the fact that as the majority of our public uh, is very interested in Latin cultures. Most of us are either Hispanic or Latin. And for us to have the work of Osvaldo included uh, in such exhibition and to be in such a center in Vancouver, it really does uh, feel as, um, as an effort to, of inclusion, right? And, and I think also as an individual, I, I feel particularly touched and um, also, how to say, reached and also included myself as public to see Latin American artists uh, being heard and, and giving uh, such, a, uh, such a space. Mm -hmm. So can you tell us a little bit about, about that? How did Osvaldo come to mind? How does his work speak to the other works in this room? Okay, um, well, your question brings up so many things. Um, well, my uh, co-curator Diana Frundle, she had been following Osvaldo's work um, since he moved here, I guess in 2015. Um, am I right? 
Um, but I actually know Osvaldo from when we were both living in Montreal um, and we worked together on an exhibition called Personal Mythologies um, that we presented at uh, the center, a center called The May, Montreal Art Interculturel. Uh, and this was a project with um, Osvaldo, so I've really been following his um, his his career since um, since that exhibition was from 2012. Um, so when I moved here to Vancouver, he's I mean of course he's always been in my you know in my mind. And when I started working on this project, um, Diana had already been thinking of him. Um, he his work really embodies um, our interest in. Um, storytelling but also using drawing and animation but of course um, what is especially interesting I think about his work is how he's um, has been cultivating and developing this hybrid style um, that you know is bringing in um, references to um, uh, Salvadoran folklore um, to you know, Mayan iconographies, um, Mexican graphic art traditions, um, but also, um, you know, references to works, European artists like, like Goya, which we also have his work in conversation with. Um, in terms of um, representation that you mentioned, I think that, um, I think, it's important to to show within the Vancouver context, within the context of BC, and also within the context of Canada, that there's a range of different perspectives. Um, I think it's important not only for um, uh, Latin or um, Hispanic communities, but also for um, the culture at large. Um, we really wanted just to have a diversity of aesthetics and perspectives and just we were kind of only limited by space, time, and budget. <laughs> but of course, we hoped that our focus on stories, which I think is some, a theme that resonates with a lot of different people, that despite the specificity of what Osvaldo is bringing from his perspective, but also looking at his own experiences as an immigrant and um, looking at the civil war in El Salvador, for example, that people, all people from different backgrounds can also find something in there that they can relate to. This is probably the question that no curator wants to be asked, but do you have a favorite piece by Osvaldo? <laughs> <laughs> um, oh yeah, that's, that's, that's really hard. <laughs> I, think, um, I, I think what has been interesting um, maybe what I can say what has been interested in this new body of work, and I've spoken to Osvaldo about this also, is um, looking at um, this emergence of new, of, a new, of new visuals around flora that's just sort of emerging and vegetation that's emerging from these amputated bodies, and that's a big shift in his work. Um, and I think it kind of suggests, at least this is my reading, of a new, uh, maybe, a bit of an optimism or hope that I think has shifted from his past work. This room of the exhibition, it definitely has a certain character. Um, there's uh, something um, maybe uh, really touching upon feelings, perhaps. Um, there's, you know, we see a lot of uh, references to smoke. Um, we definitely see um, this kind of presence of violence, uh, but despite the violence, there's some sort of perseverance and, uh, perseverance and some sort of uh, growth uh, coming. So we have Osvaldo's work, uh, we have Goya's etchings, which you were telling us, you were sharing with us that uh, Goya, Goya's prints are part of the um, permanent collection of the Vancouver Gallery. And so maybe you can give us a little, share with us how this conversation comes to you as a curator. Um, in what moment do Goya's uh, etchings become interesting to, to place next to Osvaldo's work? Mm -hmm. um, well, I mean, formally, I think etchings, of course, is strongly linked to drawing, and drawing, of course, is really at the center of Osvaldo's practice. Um, so there's that. But also, I was really interested in um, pulling out an artist who um, was looking at war uh, in a way, like from this series, The Disasters of War, uh, Goya, um, we show. Um, in the first part of the series, he uses more of a journalistic um, approach to the the, um, uh, the occupation of France in Spain. 
and um, but near the end, his work shifts and it becomes more um, emotionally fraught. He's using more symbolic or bringing in, um, um, you know, imaginary creatures um, that kind of suggest a sort of psyche that has been affected by war. And I think you can also think of that. That also kind of resonates throughout um, uh, Osvaldo's work, where you can see the impact of war, but it's not presented necessarily in, you know, obviously it's not uh, presented in a really literal or documentary style. He's using um, an approach that maybe kind of draws the viewer in in a seductive kind of way because the aesthetic is so um, um, detailed and beautiful and unique. And, and then we are maybe more open to visit those kind of more difficult issues that it uh, evokes. Is there anything else that you would like to say about um, this, the, the creation of this room in particular? Just the conversations between the artworks. Um, I think like Howie Choi's work in relation to Osvaldo, in, in many ways they are um, their peers. They both have come from a background in drawing. Um, or they're around the same age. Um, there's uh, so there's those those kind of formal connections. There's an in, there's a focus I think on death and the spirit world that you can see uh, not only in Howie's work but also in um, Ed Pian's work, uh, where he's looking at sort of um, uh, Taiwanese ghosts. Um, yeah, so I think this is just a room where, um, and of course then it was wonderful to show Osvaldo's work in relation to, to Goya. I think there's also kind of like almost an idea of time travel, <laughs> you could talk about it that, where they're speaking to each other over time. And I think that's also really interesting. We, we could have decided just to focus on contemporary artists, but I think it's interesting to um, think about these works in conversation with each other across time and across space. Wonderful, yes, thank you. I think also as an as audience myself, uh, just stepping into this room and seeing that connection. Uh, with Osvaldo, we talked about syncretism and we talked about you know, the, the Spanish presence in our Latin cultures. So to me, uh, to also see Goya, Goya's presence in front of Osvaldo, there was definitely a very interesting reading um, as an individual. Um, also the fact that we were looking at etchings that are, you know, they're, they're small in scale and they definitely call us to, to, to go visit them and engage with them. Mm -hmm. And with Osvaldo's work, um, it's a bit similar to me as well that we have large pieces, but there's, there's so many details to mm -hmm. kind of unveil and, mm -hmm. and the colors are the ones that kind of call us and then we have to engage into these, these narratives. So, I mean, I guess what I'm trying to say is congratulations on, on, on this room. I think there's definitely a, a very interesting um, contrast between these two artists. And I, I would also like to ask if you want to uh, just say anything to our audience in regards to the exhibition in general. What can they expect um, when they come? Just maybe an invitation uh, for them to, to actually come see these works in person, which are very different than, than seeing them online. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. I mean, thank you for your interest. And of course, thank you to Osvaldo for his, you know, his work, which is kind of the reason we're here. Um, but yeah, I hope audiences, um, we hope um, that there's a kind of accessibility to this exhibition because I think there's something very drawing about um, drawing, drawing the medium of drawing and animation. Um, drawing, I think, because we've all done it, you know, so we have a sort of physical memory of that or a, a knowledge. Animation, I think there's a link to childhood and play, and um, we haven't really discussed uh, Osvaldo's animation, for example, but that's another thing that also, animation, I think, is something that draw, is drawing people in. And I think, I just hope they enjoy the range of um, stories and uh, approaches and perspectives that are presented here, and also um, think about the, the, the stories that, um, that what stories are missing, what stories need to be told, what stories um, triggers in their memory um, when they see these works. Thank you.